Boop, here we are. We're live. Happy Friday, everyone. Ooh, I don't... It says my live video is starting, but to what extent is that? Oh, now it says I'm now live. I, I jumped the gun on saying happy Friday, everyone, and I feel bad about that. And isn't that what this is all about, is feeling bad? Just getting ourselves settled here. Hope everyone is off to a good start for their Friday. Mm, how is my Friday going? Not too bad. This has been, so I should check my calendar. Is this the first week back for me? It is. So first week back from a month off, I take December and June off every year. And that presents its own sort of um, challenges. Challenges um, presents its own like things to be with. Boom, number one, Andrew, number one on the comments. You got the first post. See you later now. You've come and you've done it. He's come and done. That's all there is to do. So the early bird, that's right. I love you for it, brother. So um, you know that feeling of a long weekend and then and then Monday looms and you're like, ah, frig, Monday's here. Frig you, Monday, in your butt. That's present coming back from a month off. You know, a month off can sort of carry with it a lot of uh, dread, a lot of fear, can be like what's piled up in the intervening time. How are my clients doing? You know, they've they've not been in relationship with me and I've not been in relationship with them for a month. What's the impact of that? How's that gonna show up for them? Um, and so there's all of that. There's like a, you know, you come back from a month away, there's a big wad of unknown. And that's often one of the things that makes Mondays and, you know, returning from vacation at all is part of what makes it kind of rough is that we don't like the unknown. We're not big fans of the unknown because the unknown is kind of unsafe. Have you noticed that? The unknown is where you get hit, you get beat down. Not necessarily, but you get the idea. So c coming back from that amount of time off for me can often um, initially stir a bit of like, oh boy, what am I coming back to? What am I gonna discover? What am I gonna bump into? What am I gonna find? Let's have a sip of tea here. Mugs up, as my friend Adam says. Get that mug up. Nice and high. Look at it. Mm, you're a good looking mug, buddy. I love this mug. It's so cool. It's such a cool shape. Nice color. It's pleasingly pebble dashed. And then that wooden handle. Oh, oh forget about it. That doesn't conduct heat. No way. I don't know why. Why does ceramic conduct heat better than wood? I'm curious about that. I'm going to wiki that now. I'm going to add that to my notes here, which I'm gonna tell you about later. I'm gonna show you how I use Rome Research and um, my notes to organize my thoughts, to do what Tiago Forte calls building a second brain. So we're gonna dive into that a little bit rather than talking about the ontological kind of idea of productivity, which is to say like, who am I being? And what does that mean in terms of my productivity? I'm gonna talk more about the phenomena of it in my life, which is to say like, what are the things I, I surround myself with that support my own productivity? But first, to research, why does wood conduct heat worse than ceramic? We're going to learn about it. Uh, Andrew, you're reading, you can imagine the discomfort that comes from taking a month off. Yes, indeed. You take a week off every quarter and actually empowering the rest of recovery without a focus of, on work can be challenging. Yeah. It's not even a true week off as I work my full-time job. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, it, it's... Um, it's part of what's so challenging for people when they retire, they lose their purpose. And when we, when we lose our purpose, especially, you know, everyone has um, a balance of alpha and omega energies. Alpha is what we typically think of as the masculine energy in polarity work, but you don't have to subscribe to making it male, female. That's more a, a convenience of nomenclature. It's an easier way of describing it. Alpha and omega I like, because it takes us out of the gendered idea. The alpha energy is that part of the human spirit that is purpose driven, that is sort of like, I'm going to build a monument on that mountain and now I have a thing to do and I'm going to put that, I'm going to put myself towards that purpose. And when you take a month off, you're really taking away a lot of that purpose. And so that can be, you know, uh, a bit shaky. It can throw you off. And then to come back to try to reestablish that, that can be its own kind of thing. So one, that's been a little bit of what this week has looked like. And then the second part is... When I first come up to the month off, there's a part of me that is just like, fuck all y'all. It's time for vacation. It's party time. I'm going to be a teenager again. I'm not going to have any. I, I usually let go of a lot of my structure that supports me through my day to day. And um, 
what what happens towards the end of the month off is I'm like, I cannot wait to be an adult again. And I could, of course, start that sooner, but having that like um, that deadline, uh, I'm just going to open this window here, get a little bit of airflow going, airflow it up. There we are. That's better. A little fan going. Having having that deadline, I get resistant leading up to it, just like a teenager or a young child being sort of told like, hey, you need to do this. I, there's a part of me that's very resistant. And so as I come closer to that date, the temptation, the part of my... I guess the youthful part of me or the resistant or the um, petulant part of me uh, becomes very like, fine, well, then I'm going to party as much as I can before we get to that point. If you're going to take it away, I'm going to really, you know, abuse it, so to speak. I'm going to get it all in me. And so I'm always, as I come back from this time off, I'm working to become more um, empowered in that, in my relationship to that part of myself. Can I, can I not make it wrong? But can I be a little more gentle with it and perhaps let it be a little more gentle with me? And so starting Monday, I start getting up at a really regular time. I start working out again. I've worked out for a, a month. I'm a little sore. Start riding the Peloton bike again. Start doing things like clearing every morning, meditating, practicing with Bay, practicing with my wife. All of these things start to come back into my life. And they often, um, just like... It often feels anytime we start a new structure, we take on something new. At first, it's quite novel and nice. It's a, it's refreshing to be like, yeah, I feel like I'm actually living like an adult once again. Or oh, the thing is, I start checking my money again. I'm, I'm back on top of reviewing our account, checking like how are we spending our money uh, during the month off. I tend not to do that, and we get a little looser in how we spend our money. And and so, <laughs> and then of course, like I think a lot of us, I get resistant to taking a look. I don't want to look at that mess that I've created. What am I going to discover if I look there? I'll just keep not looking. So all of these things start to happen this week. And um, not surprisingly for me, part of what happens as a result of that is I feel better. I feel a little more on top of things. There's less unknowns, sort of open threads, like well, how is our money? Are you eating healthy? Adam, you haven't done anything for yourself in quite a while. You know, all of those thoughts start to go away. It can also it can also feel a little bit like, ugh, I have to do the stuff. So th there's like this balance that happens as I as I come back into the structure of what my regular working life, my regular sort of weekly life looks like. So that's how I'm doing. It's a long-winded answer to my question. How am I doing? How many people we got here? We got four people. Speak and be seen. I know Andrew's here. Who else is here? Please. Say hi, so I can say hi back to you. While you're doing that, look at this cool-ass green malachite heart stone that I found at, at the Rock Hound store here in Victoria. If you live in Victoria and you have children, I highly recommend you bring them to the Rock Hound store. It's this old-ass store that's probably been there since 1970. This is very old. And it has all sorts of gorgeous, cool, natural minerals and rocks that they sell and that are beautiful. And like, you can tell the people are complete nerds. I found a piece of petrified wood and it had like the price on it. And then there's another stickier that just said, um, really neat bumps, exclamation mark with an arrow pointing to some bumps on the wood. So like <laughs> either that's like a marketing ploy, but a pretty old school one, or the way I received that was like, wow, these people fucking love rocks. They just think this stuff is so cool. And I think it's so cool. So that's where I got this awesome green malachite rock. I dropped it almost immediately. You can kind of see it's a little bit, uh, there's a chip right there. Bay, Bay lovingly, <laughs> probably shaking her head at me, crazy glued most of it back, but she said, there's still some pieces I can't find. Perhaps that's a metaphor, Adam. <laughs> She's healing my heart, but there's some pieces that are just can't be found. So let me know. Let me know who's here. Come on, guys. There's six of you now. I need names. I need to put faces to these this digital eyeball I'm seeing here. Andrew says he allowed his structures to fall off slightly over the weekend, didn't actually like it. Ah, uh ho. -oh. I think in the future I'll still keep the structures like clearing, meditation, the rest of the week, or the, during my rest week, and utilize it to catalyze for the rest and recovery itself. Yeah, that's how I do it too. Hey, Dave, nice to see you, brother. I usually... The way this one went is I, I began the week off and kept a lot of stuff, and then as the week goes, I become... Because I'm not surrounded by 
ongoing regular conversations with my coach, conversations with my clients, which are a call forward for me to, to be really um, clean and responsible in my own life. Like as those things go away, there's less, there's less, um, I guess we could call it like energy around me that contributes to sort of keeping me doing the structures. Another way to think of it is like the floor is tilted a little bit to have me slide down towards letting go of all my structures. This is kind of the nature of um, transformational work in general is that we like, we'd like this idea that like, oh, I could go and do plant medicine and then that's it, the work is done and it's locked in. Or I could go to a Tony Robbins event and have this big awakening when I walk across coals or, you know, do whatever. And then boom, it's, I'm there, you know, I, I've got that set, I'm transformed. Or have a conversation with our coach for like three months and then done. And while on some level there's some truth to that in that, the transformation from caterpillar to butterfly is not, it's a one-way transformation. You don't undo that. So when you create a breakthrough, you create a breakthrough, it's yours. But the nature of like living from a truly transformed place is that that requires ongoing, um, I guess the best word would be like generating. We have to, it's not free. We have to invest energy into doing that and we have to invest energy into structures we have to invest ourselves our time our energy sometimes our money into structures that support us to stay in a transformational conversation rather than the default conversation the default conversation is all around you it's the conversation you hear at the grocery store out of someone's car window when they're shouting at the person in front of them you know it's the default conversation is one of blaming other people, one of victimhood, one of like, it's not my fault, one of, if only that thing changed, then my life would be different. This is the default conversation. And so it's it's automatic to slide back into that conversation. You'll still keep your breakthroughs, but slowly but surely over time, grime picks up. Just like, um, you know, like a piece of brass like this requires polishing to keep it polished. Over time, it oxidizes, it becomes tarnished, and we have to put ongoing work into maintaining an untarnished thing. So that's kind of the nature of transformation. It's kind of the nature of taking time off. And it's, and it's, oh, it's not a bad thing. It's simply a thing. It's just the way it goes. This is interesting. Can you guys see? Are you guys actually able to see what I'm talking? Because my live producer has a button now that says go live. It's almost as though it's forgotten that I'm live. So can someone, this is not a ploy to get those of you that haven't said hi yet to say hi, but can someone just say, yeah, you're, you're live. We're seeing you because Facebook's being all wackadoodle. Oh, maybe it's this. I have another tab. Here we go. This is the tab I want to open. Okay. There we go. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Great. I'm live. I think I've got it sorted out now. Uh, okay. So that's the week. That's how that's gone. Let's go back to the live show notes that I've got here. We are you. Hello, Darren. Nice to see you. Thanks for your suggestion. We're going to talk about that today. It's such a good one. Oh, hey, Ruth. Did you already say hi? And I just didn't see it. That's nonsense. Oh, yeah. Hi, Adam. The Rock is cool. Oh, there you are. Okay, cool. Yeah, The Rock is cool. I assume you're not talking about the movie. Here are some other cool rocks that I've got here. I have a piece of petrified wood. Isn't that cool? I think that's neat. I like the shape, too. I usually like array these rocks because they look beautiful to me on, um, oh, a, an audio delay. That's pretty annoying. You know what I think that is? It's because I'm using, um, I'm using uh, OBS as my camera and I suspect it's it's got some delay in it. So I'm doing that just so that I can show you Rome. Uh, I wonder if there's a way I can change that. Let me know how distracting that is, Dave, because I don't want to make this an obnoxious thing to watch. But I also want to make sure I, I can show you guys Rome because I think it's really cool. I'll show you some of the rocks. This is called, I think this is selenium, I believe, is the name of this. And what I find cool about selenium, as a kid, in the East Bay Science and Nature store, which was a favorite store of mine owned by a friend's mom, it turned out, I only later discovered, they sold these and they called them TV rocks. And the reason it's called a TV rock is it projects whatever you put behind it. Isn't that cool? So we can put like, here's a big wad of copper I've got here. Uh, and there we go. I can put that in front and you can, ah, you can kind of see it. It kind of goes through. Yeah, there you go. Uh, eh. How cool is that? Through that rock. This is basically like a big wad of fiber optic cables, I suppose. 
So I have that. That's really fun to me. This is the most boring part for anyone listening, catching this on the podcast. But don't you worry, podcast listeners. You can skip this if you want, and we're going to get to the good stuff soon. I've got this neat looking obelisk of tiger's eye. Tiger's eye, very strong alpha energy to it. Very powerful, kind of um, driven, purpose-filled kind of uh, stone. I think that's beautiful. Yeah, great. Ruth has got the idea. She's mostly listening, but she's turning around just to see the rocks. I'll show you two more pieces I have here, and then we're going to get to topics. I found this geode in uh, Portland that I thought was pretty cool. Just a little, little guy, just a small geode. To me, geodes are like the coolest thing and such a beautiful metaphor for, um, for humans. Rocky stuff on the outside and then on the inside, all this magic and wonder. If only we are willing to look and hit people with a hammer. That's not me advocating for you hitting people with a hammer. And then lastly, here's a piece of coral that I uh, brought back when we went to uh, Tahiti and did a sort of a once in a lifetime trip with our friends, Ben and Ashley. They, uh, they have a YouTube channel called Sailing Nahoa, N-A-H-O-A. Uh, they're amazing. They're traveling around the world and have been doing so for probably almost five years now on a yacht, not a yacht, a, a catamaran. They record it, they make gorgeous videos, and they have just about a year ago, I think, had their second child, and they're raising them on the boat. An amazing lifestyle, right? So they're up to all kinds of crazy stuff. And uh, early on in their journey, we uh, and ours, we we flew out there for our first month off and um, sat on that boat with them for about three weeks. We dove in these tiny little coral rings. Uh, we did what's called a drift diving, where the coral ring, the atoll, has a little sort of break in it and the tide comes through. And so what you do is you you get a snorkel and you get a dinghy and then you just hold on to the rope on the dinghy and the tide brings you in through. You don't have to do anything. It just sort of drags you along with the current. You want to make sure the current's coming in to the atoll, not going out to the ocean. And then um, and then just witness all of this amazing stuff. Sharks, uh, parrot parrotfish, which are kind of cool because you've got your head under the water and you can hear these parrot fish just crunching away on coral. So that was the only piece of coral I brought back. I didn't want to bring much because I'm pretty sure this stuff is not alive. So it's okay to take, but you're not, I know you're not meant to take the live coral because it, it deteriorates the, um, the biosphere, I suppose. Anyhow, those are the cool rocks. It's time for us to, Oh, it, we're going to do Rome first. So this is a little more visual. Um, Sorry if you're listening on the podcast, but I think this is valuable. And I've wanted to share about Rome for a while because it's really, um, I find it a very revolutionary thing. And so I'm going to talk about how I've progressed in terms of my own, like managing all of the stuff of life, all of the information, what that's been like for me, how that contributes to my productivity and where I've settled and how I think Rome is really, really a big deal in terms of, of this. It's a little, um, it can take a bit of time to get into. It's not the most sort of like, well, we'll come to that. I'll talk about why it is the way it is. So in the early days, I relied almost entirely on notebooks and I would um, make to-do lists. I'd put them in a notebook and then, you know, hopefully go back to the to-do list. But really the to-do list kind of existed um, in the moment. So it'd be Sunday, I'd be like, okay, what do I need to get done? I'd write it down in a to-do list and that to-do list would work for me for that Sunday, but then I'd forget about it and I'd never come back to it. And, you know, there was, unless I made a, uh, a real concerted effort to, to do something about it, to like come back to it, it would just be lost and wind up with multiple notebooks, you know, note taking porn, if you like, and so on and so forth. Oh, Dave, you're using Rome. That's awesome. Cool. And and then came about Palm Pilots. I'm dating myself, but that's all right. I'm old. Palm Pilots and then smartphones. And so I started to integrate those. And I would use digital notes, which was a little bit better because you could search them. But it was still not the most efficient process. And then Evernote came out, which was um, sort of like a web two, an early web 2.0 application, really. And the idea of Evernote was a database where you can store all your notes and you can have notebooks, virtual notebooks, and then as many notes as you want in the notebooks. And you can upload anything. You can upload an audio file. You can upload a video file. You can upload a photo or something like that. And all of it is available in Evernote. That was amazing. 
So finally, for the first time, there's like this repository, a place where I could put stuff and then search it and access it online as well as on my computer. I didn't need an application. So for a long time, Evernote was the thing I used and I would write in Evernote. That was the place where my writing was held. I would capture ideas and stuff in Evernote into like a notebook I'd call ideas I've captured or something like that. Um, and then for to-do lists and stuff that existed somewhere else, a bit separate. And I used Evernote for about 10 to 12 years. And then I got to a point where I started to get like, it was fine. I was still using it, but I was a bit frustrated because their development was lagging and it, it didn't, I used it kind of by point of necessity. So it didn't really contribute a great deal to my life. It didn't like make things better. It was like a filing cabinet that worked pretty good. So I just shoved stuff in it and then forget about it until I needed it. So it wasn't adding anything new on a day-to-day -day basis. It was just something I was using ongoingly. Evernote was great for the period of time that I used it. And then I got, I found Rome. And the way I came across Rome was a friend of mine in a networking group I'm a part of called Metal reached out and, and he had this crazy idea. It was like, you know, I want to share this idea with you. It's this application called Rome and I'm using it to support people having digital psychedelic experiences. And I was like, I don't know what the hell you're talking about, but let's talk. Sure, why not? My friend CK. I, I still don't fully understand what he was talking about that, but as I watched Rome and he talked about it, I was like, this sounds compelling. And what I did after we talked is I went and watched a video and the video was like someone talking about their top 100 things they use Rome for. Rome Research, the name of the application. Here, I'll put, I'll put a little, um, this is the program's web page. There you go. So I watched this guy using it. And it was the sort of thing where within about 10 minutes of watching this video, I was like, I could already tell this is something incredibly powerful as a tool and that I'm going to be using. I don't know what it's going to look like to build that up, but I could already tell just by the way he described it. So um, my intention is to show you how I use it and like help you see some of its power. And then you can kind of like, oh, is that something I'm intrigued by, something that I find compelling? So let's see if this works. I'm going to click. Oh, look at that. It does work. How amazing is that? I've got... Uh, some stuff going on here, some different cameras. So you can see me still, I'm still looking right here with you. But then at the same time, you've got what's called my daily page here under underneath. So um, here, let's go to Saturday because that'll be blank as a starting point. So the way Rome is initially organized is in daily pages. There's a page for every day and every day has a page. You don't have to do anything about that. And you could think of, I, Andrew, I did. I'll talk more about that in a sec. But I bought, I bought the believer, the true believer package, which is, I think, a commitment for five years. I was just like, this is, I'm, I'm, it's worth it. So your default in Rome, everything is organized according to bullet points. So your thoughts, like here is a thought, here is a second thought, here is a sub thought of the second thought. Nothing particularly revolutionary about this, right? So. But what this does is that I can look at all of my daily notes. So I could look back to Friday. Here's my notes for Friday. Or I could click to Saturday. Oh, there's my notes for Saturday. The thing that's amazing about Rome is that you can link any note to any other note. So whereas traditional information models are hierarchical, which means I have to figure out, does this recipe belong in the notebook called recipes I'd like to try? Or does it belong in the notebook called things to cook with Bay? And you know we can start to get into like, well, just combine those. That's not the point. The point is you have to do a bunch of thinking to figure that out and the note can only go underneath one hierarchy. You can kind of create further hierarchies, but there's a limitation to that. In Rome, every note can link to every other note. It's a many to many sort of thing. So what that means is that I can do things like I can say by typing slash, I can insert, oops, a link to tomorrow. So there's tomorrow's date. And I can say, make sure I pick up milk. Boom. There's something I've put into my daily note for Saturday, and I've, I've tagged it with tomorrow's date. What I can then do is I can click over here to Sunday. When I come to Sunday, of course, it's not going to work. <laughs> I just thought it was going to work. Did I do that? Oh, I see what's done there. It's because tomorrow is actually this date. I have to change this 
pretend that I did July 10th. There we go. So on Saturday, let's say I put in, all right, Sunday, I need to make sure I pick up milk. And then if I go to Sunday, under Sunday's daily note, there's a reference here to July 10th, make sure I pick up milk. So anything that I tag with Sunday's date is now gonna show up underneath this. That's kind of cool. But guess what? We're just getting started. This is gonna get way cooler. So if I go back to Saturday, what you can do in Rome is you can create templates. You can create any kind of template. And so I've created a template for my daily notes. The way I bring up a template is I type JJ, daily notes, daily notes template. So I do this at the start of every day. And what it does is it fills my daily note with a bunch of stuff. So the first thing it does is it puts this stand thing. I'll come back to that. The next is I have it pull all of my appointments from my daily calendar, my Google calendar, and put them here for me. So Saturday, I got to go find a present for mom, and I've got a photo shoot with my photographer, Trevor. I also fill out a to-do thing, and this holds all of the stuff that I typically want to make sure I do every single day, more or less. Of course, I can still like, um, if I don't want to do that, I can remove it. I can add stuff to it. I'm not stuck on this but this is the default, it puts us in immediately. So my to-do, which has a little checkbox, has input calories, which is something I do sometimes when I'm, when I'm um, working on um, really eating healthy or when that's part of the structure I'm doing, I can, I can work with my calories here. It's got record a short video on leadership. This is something I'm doing with my social media team, I'm trying to be a little more terse and record shorter videos so that I'm viable, not just on long form kind of speaking, review my money in Mint and through my bank account, make sure I lift weights and get on the Peloton, ride the bike. So I've got this to-do section. We'll come to some of that in a sec. And I can write any notes on the fly. So these are the notes that I took over the course of, what is this, Saturday? Saturday. And as I'm typing notes, I can link it. I can put a tag. So I can tag, link, and create this as leadership. Um, what does a leader do that gets in the way of management? Maybe that's a thought I have that day. And you can see that's now tagged. And finally, I have this week's practices. So this is all of the stuff I've worked on with my coach that I wanna make sure I've got front and center so that anytime I come back to Rome to look at what I'm doing, I've got my practices here. And what I do is I copy that from my coaching calls. I've also set up the template. Oh, sorry, I've gotta scroll up, don't I, in this. Oh, that's, that's obnoxious, isn't it? It doesn't let me do that. What if I, ah, there we go. Thanks, Andrew. That was really important, <laughs> leaving you out of that. So these are the notes on the fly. There we are. Yeah. So we've got this template. It fills out this stuff. You can also set up these templates. You can see these are blue and links. So this is already set up so that as soon as I, um, as soon as I enter this template, these are already set up to link to whatever they have to link to. So for example, I've got this thing here called stand and my stand is the result of me going through a clearing exercise. If I click on stand, it takes me to the page where I have all of my clearing exercises, all of the times. These are all the days I've cleared and then the stand I've created for each of those days. So if I wanted to create a new stand, I've got a template for that too. So I'd click that link from here. I go click takes me here, I put a new bullet at the top, and I enter in my template for my daily stand. Boom, there's today's date. We're set up to do the stand, and then I'd go through the clearing exercise. Blah, 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 I am dumb. And then my stand might be like love, as an example. And then once I've done that, I can go back here. You know, you get the idea, I can fill that in as my stand. That's not a proper stand that I've created, so I'm not gonna clear that way. It looks like I haven't cleared today, which I haven't. <laughs> or that's Saturday, I guess. Saturday is that day. Okay, so first of all, the power of the daily pages and the daily notes is incredible. And what happens is we get really worried, or at least I do, well, if I just write something down like a daily you know, morning pages in my notebook and I write it down, I'm gonna forget about it. What the daily notes allows you to do, as I've demonstrated here, is you can link. You can create links and tags for everything you put. And all of those links and tags point back to a particular note. So everything I've written on leadership, if I click this, this tag here, it'll take me to a page called leadership. 
I haven't written anything in leadership, but what it shows me below that is all of the references I've made. So every time I've written about leadership and then tagged leadership, all of those notes point here. So you can see, here's the note I just created. What does a leader do that gets in the way of management? And then it looks like uh, today proper, as opposed to Saturday, I had written, oh, leadership is a quality of being rather than a position. So that's just a thought in the moment. And what this allows you to do is you can start to filter these, um, these things so that they, they, um, you, you show only places where you've talked about, like, maybe I want to see only places where I've talked about leadership and coaching at the same time, or this project I'm working on for myself called the Nexus, ah, where all of the times when I've referenced both leadership and the Nexus, and then I can see all of that. So it starts to allow you to find without having to create it yourself, all of the places where you've linked these two ideas together. And that makes it very easy to start to discover connections between ideas that you've had as you write. So you don't have to go through your notebooks and be like, okay, what have I written on leadership and then cross reference it? It's all searchable. This is amazing. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. You'll also notice in these linked references, I've got references to highlights I've made. So Rome, I've set up an application that automatically pulls all the highlights I make on my Kindle when I'm reading into Rome, and then I can go through and tag it. So here, reading a book called The Madness of Crowds, which is a, a fictional book. Uh, it's an Inspector Gamache series, which is an amazing series if you like detective novels set in Quebec. So if you like Quebec or Canada. And I just highlighted this. What had Abigail said? Scientists might appear rational, but they were in fact completely at the mercy. I don't know what else that says, probably of their emotions. And so I put a note here, oh, emotions and leadership. So if I wanna write about emotions, that might be a good thing to consider. I could pull that in. Really cool. Here's a presentation I did for someone. Here's a get lit episode note that I wrote about. Leadership's like getting a massage, more books, you can see, et cetera, et cetera. So very powerful feature of Rome. Let's read what you guys have written as I'm going through this. So Andrew, you're saying this is super interesting because I have multiple documents and I also use a notebook. This seems so much easier with Rome. Yes, indeed. That's how I feel too. Ruth, you're saying, can you use it with an electronic notebook? Because I still like writing some things by hand. I don't yet have a Remarkable. Remarkable is the, um, the main electronic notebook I'm familiar with. I'd be shocked if there wasn't a way to, to integrate that. I'm pretty certain they work, but that's the next thing I want to look into once I get a Remarkable. And that would be a feature I would require. Whatever electronic notebook I'd get, I'd want it to be integratable so that I can take handwritten notes and push them directly into here so I can then search them, work with them. Um, Andrew, you're saying it's very cool. I've got massive lists of notes and content for the future and I almost never go back and review it. I love the tagging system. Yeah, it's super cool. Lydia's saying this is amazing. I know it's incredible, right? It's remarkable what this does, it's so powerful. Um, as we pull in stuff, we can start to tag people. And so um, my friend Michelle Aiken and I connect every morning on Fridays at 8 a.m. And so I, I pull this in and then I tag her. You know, I could also tag, oh, Adam Quiney. And I can also, um, I can sort of, if I don't want that link to show up as Adam Quiney, I can rename it Adam. And then it, it, it'll go to Adam Quiney, but it shows Adam. So if I click on Michelle Aiken, these are the times, I've not referenced her very much in my notes, but these are just the times when she's shown up there and I've tagged her. And it looks like, do we have any unlinked references? There's another three times I haven't done that. Okay, there's a few more things that I wanna um, show. Hi, Lynn, it's nice to see you. Uh, oh, yes. So the live show, I keep all of my notes here for the live show. And what happens, first of all, if I wanna create, mm, this probably won't work today because I've already built a template for it. We'll do it anyhow. So. I've set up a template so that I can, I don't have to, um, let me show you what my notes look like first and then I'll show you how the template works. So if you click in here, each of these live shows, I click in and they look like this. And this is based on a template that I've set up. So here's the title, because YouTube only allows 100 characters, if I was posting out to YouTube as well, I've got it set up so I, I've got a word count monitor here and I can be like, this is the title, how are we doing for length? And then I stop and I go up here. Oh, I have to put it underneath that. Okay, great, it's 47 characters. Okay, so I can make it a bit longer. Click up, oh, get out of there. 
82 characters. So that is there so that I can kind of capture the title for YouTube. It's just a little bit of a convenience for me. I'm not posting on YouTube right now currently or not really worrying about that. So that doesn't get filled. Here's the description. Here's what I've, you know, if you're on this live, you've seen that description. I put that all here. Here's highest viewers. If, <laughs> if I want to feel bad or be annoyed at the world for not watching me enough, I can track how many people showed up. And in theory, I could, I could even tag this like that. I could start tagging that so then I could click the highest viewers and I could search to see through all of the linked references, how, what's the highest and what's the trend look like? I haven't really bothered with that. And then here are the notes. So my notes, as I'm building up the live show, I've got the suggestions that you guys have awesomely provided. And I just copy these directly from Facebook. And so what that does when I copy it in here, Rome automatically creates a link back to that comment. So if I wanted, we could click this and it would take me to Facebook to where the comment was. I don't have to do anything about that. Just when I copy and paste, that's how it shows up. And then I've got the actual comments that you guys have generously provided as suggestions for topics. And I usually take that, put it in here like, okay, what could I talk about? What might I say? Here's the notes I had for Rome research. And then I convert that into just what, what will the description look like? Super helpful. And again, so that I don't have to like remember all that and manage that, I've got a template set up. So I just go daily, uh, sorry, this is the live show we're doing, isn't it? Put that asterisk back there, JJ live show, boom. And it'll just, <laughs> it's not gonna work because I already have one, but it would fill all of this out and then let me just space it in there. Okay, there was one last thing I wanted to show you. Let me, oh yeah, I'll show you uh, how I'm using this for recipes and cocktails and then we'll, we'll wind down on talking about Rome because it's quite a visual part. So one of the things that I enjoy doing is making cocktails. I really like the craft of bartending and I'm learning more and more and more as the pandemic has gone on. It's kind of over now, but, and for a while I was just bookmarking cocktails, which was cool. But then I would start, I'd have like this set of bookmarks. It was like 50 long. And I was like, are these, have I tried this one? I can't really remember. How does this work? And so, what I started to do was bring those cocktails and recipes into Rome. And the way that looks, let's think of, uh, how about the green point? That's a good cocktail. So I've got, well, first let's create a new cocktail. We'll just call it cocktail, not cock. New page. We'll create a new page. And I've got, again, a header for this. Boom. So what this does, as soon as I'm putting in a new cocktail, it fills, I, I've got on Rackley set to fill this out. These are some default tags. I can add my own tags. Got ingredients. What are the list of ingredients? When did I first try it? Where did I find that recipe? And the directions. How do you make it? We're going to delete this page now because it's not so important. Get out of here. And we're going to go to a cocktail I'm a big fan of, which is the industry sour. Whoops. The Fernet sour. That's the one I want. This is my favorite drink quite popular. If, if you order this at a, at a bar and the bartender knows their stuff, you'll get some credit because it's kind of, it's called the industry sour because people, um, people in the, it's kind of a bartender's drink. So the way this works, we've got the ingredients here, which are all listed for Bronca, green chartreuse, lime juice, simple syrup, amazing drink. It doesn't look that appealing, but when you try it, it's a lovely complex drink. I can click through on each of these because I've tagged them. I've put these square brackets around them. What that does is allows me to see all of the cocktails in my sort of thing here that use green chartreuse. I'll tell you why that's amazing in a sec. Second, I got these tags. So here's the default ones. And then one, this is a personal favorite of mine. Two, it's a drink that's a little bitter. It's got a bitterness to it. And three, I've tagged this as complex. So if I'm actually, if I'm, if I'm wanting like a drink in the night that's sort of complex, boom, I can do that. Here's the source for it. And I don't have directions because all you do is you stick them in a shaker and you shake and you look cool while you do it. And that's it. Here's when I tried it. This is called an industry sour and it's one of my favorite cocktails. Bloody good drink. Here's what's cool about this. So if we click through to cocktails, I've created this page. Here's my master list of cocktails. When I created it, here's the meta tags. And then you can use this page. I've set it up to be able to search for anything. So I can at any point, I can create a query that searches all of my notes. So this query here says, show me all the cocktails that I've tagged as cocktails and to try. And it gives me 35 results. These are all cocktails that I've tagged as to try. That means I've not yet tried them. And I can click through to each of these. Oh, what about the Bitter Giuseppe? 
Oh, it's to try, it's bitter, these are the ingredients. Huh, okay. So I can quickly find a, a, a result of all the drinks I've not yet tried. Or let's say that I wanna try a nightcap or I just wanna drink a nightcap and I'm like, huh, what are the, the cocktails that I've made that are good nightcaps? So I could just create a new bullet point and I could type backslash query, meaning I wanna do a search and I wanna search for, it sort of sets it up for you. Here's example A. So I wanna search for everything that's a cocktail and that I've tagged as a nightcap. And then as, as soon as I click away from this, it's gonna run this query, boom. Here's a query for all things that are both cocktails and have been tagged as nightcap. Here's seven results. The Mauna Kea cocktail, the Golden Dream, the Amaretto Sour, the Beautiful Cocktail, Mudslide, like a mudslide, and so on and so forth. And the last thing that's quite cool is I can click on this with, by holding down shift and I can bring it up on the sidebar. So if you're in the middle of working on a note, you can bring stuff up on the side to look through it. Does that look like what I want? No, okay, I'm gonna close it. We're back here. What about the Golden Dream? How does that look? Mm, mm, it's got Galliano. I like Galliano and so on and so forth. Is this cool? I think this is cool. So we're gonna delete this query that I've put here. I'm gonna show you the last thing, which is how I use this to write and what I think is amazing about um, Room when it comes to writing. So I'm gonna go back to our daily page. And um, on the left here, you'll see I've got a short a list of shortcuts. So I have like my client notes are in here. Here's all of my notes around my own coaching. And I have a page, uh, we've got the forge and I've got a page called, bum, ba, ra, I thought I had a page called authors. There it is, authorship. So this page shows all of the stuff that I'm working on as far as writing is concerned. These are links to my books. So if I click, who do you think you are? I've created a note that holds all of that. This is just meta information. So here's a folder to my Google Drive where I keep like the, the revisions. Here's all the notes. When I was pulling out pull quotes, these are all the quotes that I pulled from the book. So you can kind of have little neat things on the side. So we've got all that. And I've got pieces I've written that I think are worth keeping track of. Writing notes and writing ideas. So writing ideas are like sort of, hmm, this would be a good thing to write about. And the checkbox is whether I've actually done it. Writing notes are where I keep all of my pieces. And one of the things that's really amazing about Rome is you can fold up and fold down bullet points. So often I find with something like Evernote, it's overwhelming the amount of information I have. I like bullet points, but I'm like, ah, I can't think of all this. And so this ability to roll up and roll down a particular note so you can see all the content and hide it or, or reveal it, is a game changer. And second, you can you can zoom in to see like further. So these each of these pieces can unroll to reveal the writing piece. So here's what it looks like if I want to write a new note. I go to my writing notes and I would I would run the template I've set up. Uh, sorry, not new writing header. This is a new Oh, I guess it is writing header. Writing, there we go. Boom. So I've set this up to give a checkbox, which is, I check that when I'm like, all right, this is written and done. Hey, Katie, here's today's date. This is the date I started working on this piece. This is for me to fill out sample writing piece. That's the title that I'll put there. And I've got a word count set up. So that's just helpful because I'm prone to long, you may have noticed I'm prone to long discourse and description and talking. So we've got that so that's a little bit easier. And then I can start to write. Now you might look at this and think, man, that's like Adam is writing and holy cow, what a whole messy bunch of information surrounding the piece he's writing. I would never use this. That's a lot, right? That's quite distracting. Here's the other brilliance of Rome is that for every bullet point, you can click on it, boom and it zooms you in to just that bullet point. It shows you the breadcrumbs here. So here's where I am. This is the sort of hierarchy if you like. And now I can write just here. Ah, so clean and easy to write in this space. I'm so free of distraction. I have truly conquered life. Great, that piece is ready to ship. I can click on this, this checkbox if I want. For every bullet point, you can quickly add a checkbox if you want, just by hitting Command Enter. 
You can also cycle them, so you can change that by hitting command. If you don't want to click, you can hit it again and change it to a done checkbox. Or if you do it a third time, it goes away. And then once I've written this, I can zoom back out into my writing notes. We'll go to authorship so you see the whole thing. And once again, all of what I've written is there, and I can roll it up if I don't want to see it. So just that ability to like organize your thoughts into bullets and then zoom into a bullet to declutter and to really allow yourself to focus, it's remarkable. And again, if I was sort of like, because I've tagged this with today's date, let's say that I was wondering like, what did I, what did I write on February 16th? I can go to my little calendar and go to, let's go to February. I thought I wrote something good on February 16th or what was I thinking about? I can click here and at the bottom you'll see, ah, under authorship, it shows you this is where that got added. I wrote this. So it's tagged back to that date. So amazingly powerful sort of system. I think Rome is just, it's the truth. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of different ways. I'm going to delete this now because that's not really a, a piece that I've written. There's a lot of ways that you can use this. And what's amazing about it is how extensible it is, which means you can use it your way. I can use it my way. And it's very flexible. It doesn't impose anything on you. So some people don't use Rome at all the way I do. What I like to do is I like to create these big, um, here, take me back to authorship. I like to create kind of these sort of pages that have almost like a table of contents. And then there's like, I keep writing in there. Whereas other people won't have anything like this. They'll just create a new page every time they write something. So they're like, they're going to create a new page um, writing. They'll call it like, I don't know, new writing title. Let's, uh, what do we call this? Leadership and goats. They'll create a brand new uh, page and they'll tag it with some things. Leadership, goats. Um, goats are weird. And then they'll just start writing. Blah, 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 blah. They finish their piece. Great, they're done. And that's how they would organize their thoughts. I like to have my writing under like a series of bullets that I can open and close, but you don't have to do that. And so, um, Rome really allows a tremendous amount of freedom, whereas a lot of traditional systems don't. They impose a structure on you, and that kind of limits how widely you can use it, and it creates friction for you. I'm going to stop sharing uh, Rome now. Boom, we're back. It creates friction for you, which makes it harder to put into the system. And the, the thing that um, makes for an ideal capture system, I think, is one that makes it as easy as possible for you to put your, your thoughts and your brain and your stuff in there. So, uh, diddle my nose there. My mustache nose hairs are poking me. Let's go to your questions, and then we're going to talk about the subjects that you, I've got. There's been a bit deep, deep dive for Rome, but. So, um, Ruth, you're saying it really does look amazing. I love to see other people's organizational tools. Yeah, me too. Um, Andrew's saying, uh, does it, do you have an affiliate link? No. <laughs> Just go to Rome Research if you're interested. It's a really remarkable system. Uh, I think you can use it for free for a month. I'm pretty sure they offer that. And the best way to start using it is to just, I recommend watching like Rome for Beginners or an introduction to Rome, like a YouTube video that's usually half hour long. And that'll give you like a rough idea. And then to just to start putting in notes for a week. Just make it like I'm going to commit for a week to putting my thoughts. I'm pretty sure like my first week I was creating weird. I, I really like the movie Rounders and I'm pretty sure, yeah, I created a note called Rounders and I created a movie with that. Here are my favorite movies with atmosphere and I started tagging them just to try it out. These are some good movies. The following, that's uh, Christopher Nolan's first ever movie. It's creepy. Fight Club, Memento. You get a sense of my movie uh, likes and dislikes. Uh, so just start using it for a week and then see how it goes. And the beauty of this system is it grows with you and, and you get to grow. Um, Andrew, you ask, how well does it sync with your phone? Medium is what I would say. So there's two options. One, there's an app you can download that lets you just capture stuff on the fly and it puts it directly into your daily notes. Uh, so that's available. And two, you can use like Chrome or Safari or whatever your Firefox on your phone to go to Rome Research and log in. And then you can see all of what you've stored, all, all of your notes. It's all available. Um, but it's, um, 
sometimes it can feel like that small screen is a little bit hard to do deep work. And for me, I'm not using, I'm tr like anytime I really want to sort of do some real, some real heavy lifting mentally or, or in terms of writing or anything like that I put it on, I, I want to sit at my computer. So the way I use it with my phone is to reference stuff. I'll look things up on my phone or I'll input quick notes on the fly, but that's about it. So if you're wanting sort of like, man, I want to like, you know, be at the bus stop and be able to write a treatise, Rome can be a little bit, it can feel a little clunky for that. Um, Andrew, you're asking, does it work if you aren't connected to the internet, say if you were traveling or something like that? I'm not sure how well offline works. I'm pretty sure you can, um, Katie, download and write meow. That's awesome. I'd love to, let me know. I'd love to hear how it goes for you and, and if it if it provides something or if it's just too clunky or too, too much friction to make the shift. I, I just don't even touch Evernote now other than to reference the stuff I put in there because everything goes to Rome these days. Um, so Andrew, for me, first of all, I'm, we're almost always connected as my experience. There's rare moments when I'm not. I'm pretty sure if memory serves correct, you can write stuff and then it'll sync up, but you won't be able to reference your, what they call your graph, which is all of your notes. Um, you might be able to set up offline access, but I've not looked into that. So that'd be something to check out. And Ruth asks, how long did it take me for this to be something I was using effectively? So, um, what happened, my my progress through this was like initially I was like, okay, I'm I'm gonna invest, I'm gonna spend the money to to buy the the five year thing because I just believe this is gonna really make a difference. I watched a video like this one, I was like, holy shit, this is so powerful. And the first week I, I would like just I was just tracking everything. So I'd watch a movie and I'd be like, Seinfeld, or I'd watch Seinfeld reruns. I'd, be, I'd start taking notes on Seinfeld just to like get in the practice. I don't do that anymore. But I found within like a week and change, I was already like, okay, I'm putting everything into here. This is how I'm setting up my coaching notes and all of that. And then as time went on, I started to create more systems to support them. So I'd like create, I, I started to think like, I want a page called coaching clients. It shows all my clients and I can click into them and that shows all my notes with that client. So I'd create that. And the nice thing about Rome because of how flexible it is, you know, with Evernote, you can create a notebook and then notebook under it and a notebook under it. And you can realize, crap, this isn't the way I want to organize this. And then you kind of have to unwind all of that stuff because the notes were like, they were set up with that in mind. In Rome, because of how flexible it is, you like this points to that points to that. And you can be like, oh, I'll just create a new note that points to all of those. And that'll be my master page. Easy. So it's much easier to sort of discover this is how I want to use this and then set that up. So really incredible, really cool, really love Rome, huge nerd about it. If you have any questions going forward or if you decide to experiment with this, please let me know how it goes. I'm always looking for more people to nerd out. There's also um, on Twitter, the hashtag is Rome cult. So you can, um, you can look up Rome cult to see that. All righty. It's interesting, uh, Dave, you said that there was an audio delay. And what I notice is the camera is instantly picking up my um, my feed, like what I'm seeing live is, oh, maybe that's because I'm not, never mind, I've, I've sorted it out. I figured it out, guys. So I'm going to go back to my live notes now. <laughs> and let's see, we can talk about something other than, uh, than Rome. We've been going for a while. So... Um, what did you write, Darren? Darren wrote, Adam, in my work with corporate America and Canada, one of the biggest challenges for my clients is creating beyond their belief. And here's the belief. I want to be visible, but I'm supposed to be invisible. Oh, Cami, tell me about that issue with Evernote. I'd love to hear more. Um, just if you're willing to share in a comment, like what your issue is, because it probably masks one of mine or mimics one of mine's one of mine. So Darren's saying, yeah, the, the, in corporate America, there's this sort of belief like I, I I want to be visible. I want to be seen, but I'm supposed to be invisible. And she's just saying like, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this topic. So in corporate America, that's a common one, right? It, it's this desire for people to be seen. And yet the corporate culture, the natural uh, current that we're swimming in is kind of like, but this is the way you should be. And even when corporations try to, even when they try to do things like create diversity or, um, inclusion, or even just like 
we want more of the way you are, there's still this gentle push towards like, but within the bounds of what our culture exists. So in, in, in the, the way Darren's describing it, it's often like, I want to be the leader. I want to step forward. I want to be seen. I want to put myself out there, but I'm not supposed to. I'm supposed to just be quiet. I'm supposed to blah, 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 blah. So this exists, this, this, I want to be X, but I'm supposed to be Y exists in literally every kind of space we can put ourselves, every space we can find ourselves into. It's not just corporate America. So like, for example, in law, one of the prevalent ones I often faced was like, I want to work 30 hours or whatever the number happens to be. Let's say 40. I want to work 40 hours, but I have to, or I'm supposed to work 60 because I'm behooven. Is that right? Behoven? Whatever it is. I'm, I'm behooved to like meet the court's timelines and deadlines and all of that. So I have to do that. Or I want to stop working at 5 p.m., but I'm supposed to work as late as the partners. And so I'm meant to work till 8 p.m. and then go home and maybe sneak in a bit of food with my family before they go to bed. Um, I don't know. You could come up with these for literally everywhere. And so what this is, is ultimately, well, what's going to happen as we try to break out that out of that? Hold on. Let me find the better way to talk about this. So every culture, every cultural entity is what I'm going to call it. And a culture by a cultural entity, I mean like groups, groups of friends, organizations, jobs, volunteer groups, meetup groups, any gathering of people, any cultural entity will have its own context. A context is sort of like the norms about how you should and should not be. So that, that applies every, there's literally, it's not possible to create a cultural entity that doesn't have that. Someone could be like, uh-uh, not us, Adam. Our cultural entity, we don't have, we're very clear, we don't have any norms. Great, that's your norm. Your norm is that you don't have any norms. So you can't escape it. It's just the way it is. It'd be like trying to have no current. That is a current. So every cultural entity is going to have a context. And anytime we try to swim against that grain, anytime we try to do something outside of that context, it's going to create a bit of a breakdown. So um, I'm trying to come up with a, a good example that really works well here that's not law. Well, let's use the one you used, uh, Darren. So in, in a lot of corporate um, settings, the idea is sort of like, don't speak out of turn. Don't look stupid. That's really the, the like, don't, you know, like I did this work for a company called, um, it's a, the name of the company is BCIMC and the culture there, what they do is they invest a lot of the, they're the sort of people responsible for investing the government's um, money, basically. So the, the provincial government has a big bunch of money it's responsible for, and it puts those into like, um, you know, projects, public works, but also has a bunch of money like for pensions and stuff like that. And that money is basically a big pool of money. And if they just left in a bank account, it would be losing value. So what they do is they invest it. And these people are super, super smart. To get in there, you got to be really, really brilliant, um, really on your game. And it's like a high bar to get in. And so the, cor the culture, I was trying to say corporate and culture at the same time. The culture that shows up there is like, super, super, super brilliant and don't show up stupid. There's a real fear of like, if I put myself out there, I might look dumb and then everyone around me is going to think I'm dumb. Don't do that. So that's a bit of a, that sort of like, I want to be visible, but I'm afraid of showing up stupid. I want to be visible, but I'm supposed to be invisible. That's a little bit analogous to what um, Darren has brought us. So, any time there's a breakthrough you want to create, like I am, maybe the breakthrough here is like, I am a committed stand that I show up and put myself into the space. That breakthrough is going to be in conflict with the desire to never look stupid, never looking stupid and always showing up and being visible 
that those two necessarily have a conflict. It doesn't mean every time you put yourself into the space to be visible and share what you think is there to be shared, it doesn't mean every time you do that, you're gonna look stupid. But it does mean that there are gonna be some points where if you're putting yourself out there, you're gonna not get it right because you can't get it right all the time. If you are generously sharing yourself, if you are committed to being visible and you are doing so, there are inevitably gonna be points where you share something and then people, it's like a, like a bad fart. People are gonna be like, what was that? That's what you think. And they're gonna have a judgment. They're gonna blah, blah, blah. And what is happening in those moments is you are, you are swimming against the grain of that context, the cultural entity's context, which is don't look stupid. That is our highest priority. It's unstated. In fact, there might be like words written on the wall. They're like, our highest priority is that we be bold in putting out there what we see to put out there. But the cultural entity's context rules. It reigns supreme. So even though those words might be there, the underlying context might be like, do those words provided it doesn't violate this underlying subtext, which is don't look stupid. Don't be stupid. Be brilliant. So anytime we try to put ourselves out there and counteract that and do something that is in opposition to that or is potentially in conflict with that, we're putting ourselves at risk for what is called a breakdown. The breakdown is what is necessary for you to confront if you want to create the breakthrough. That breakdown is what happens, what you feel, what you experience, and what occurs in the cultural entity when you go against that current. So if I keep putting myself out there, let's say I take that practice on, like I'm my commitment is that I keep putting myself into the space and sharing what I see to be true, regardless of how it learns. And in doing so, I'm gonna learn how to do this more artfully, better, probably make less mistakes as time goes on, but I'm also gonna be willing to model what it's like to make mistakes and to not have it all figured out. And I think that's okay too. And so I start to practice and I start to share these things. And I start to put myself out there and be like, you know, here's what I think we should do. And maybe I do it a couple of times and I'm scared and it's, and it works. And people are like, that's a good idea. And I'm like, holy fuck, it's fucking cool. I'm king of the world. Sharing this stuff is working. And then I share something and it doesn't work. I'm going to take a sidebar here to mention that anytime you are practicing fully, you are opening yourself up to the abundance of the experience of life. So if you are sharing yourself fully and visibly and putting yourself out there, inevitably there's gonna be a point where you make a gaffe, where you don't get it right, because that's part, that's as much a part of the abundance of life as like getting, getting it wrong, getting it right, getting it halfway, saying something totally, all of that is contained, is, is a part of the abundance of life. So you're practicing putting yourself out there, you're gonna to have to come into conflict with this, this experience that goes against the cultural entity's context. As you do so, you're going to have your own emotional reaction. You're going to experience everyone else's emotional reaction to it because you're on some level violating a norm. You're showing up like a crazy person and you're showing up that way because you really believe um, there's something more important at stake here than not looking stupid. I believe it is more important to volunteer my opinions, my beliefs, my intellect, my intelligence, what I see, I believe that is more important than not looking stupid. And I believe that that would further our mission more than simply not looking stupid. And so this is what everyone is up against anytime they're trying to create a breakthrough. We don't often realize it, but that's what we're facing. That's what our fear is trying to protect us from. It's trying to protect us from not it's protecting us from that risk of violating those norms. And what it does in doing so is it stops us from ever getting to the breakdown so that we can create the breakthrough on the other side. The way the breakthrough would be created in that instance would be to like get supported, to see the reason I'm taking this on. So if the only reason I'm taking this on is like, I think it would be healthy for me to like share myself even though I'm scared, that's a terrible reason. That's just a should in disguise. It sounds good. Oh well, yeah, it's healthy for me to practice something even though I'm scared of it. And, and if you sit with that, that becomes, I'm doing this because it's a good thing to do. It would be a good thing to do. It's healthy for me is basically a version of it's a good thing to do. And then doing something because it's a good thing to do is really just, I should do this. So we need a reason beyond that, right? We need to get like, what would my life be like 
if I was able to offer myself to the world and to those around me and trust myself, even though it was scary, what would my life be like? How would my life be different? How might my job go differently? What might be the opportunities for leadership that would open up for me if I was able to step into this over and over and over again? How would that be? And we want to help the client to the, ourselves get really clear, like make that real so that it's not existing as like, it's a good idea to do this, but that we're doing this because we're present to what would be possible on the other side of that breakthrough. And from there, the game becomes getting supported and leaning into our fear in service of that thing we really want. We do that. We hit that point. We're at that breakdown. We feel like such a dork and we're like, oh my God, I should never have done this. I feel so bad. I feel so dumb. And that's when we go and we get supported by our coach. And um, hi, Carol, I'll, I'll talk, I'll mention, I'll answer your question in a sec. We get supported by our coach and our coach supports us to see like, hey, this breakdown is in service of something. Even though you feel like a jackass right now, even though you feel like everything, everyone thinks you're dumb, why is it that you have voluntarily chosen to walk into these hot coals? What are you doing this for? And that allows us to get present again to why we're doing this. And as we do that, we keep stepping into that breakdown. And the more we do that, what starts to happen is its power over us diminishes. We become almost inoculated to it. And we get to the point where we, we, we start to discover the benefits. We start to experience the results that we thought might come true if only we were willing to put ourselves out there. People start to turn to us and see like, wow, you know, I'm going to volunteer something. And thank you, Adam, for going first because it was really edgy, but I saw you do it and I want to do that. So maybe we start to be seen as a leader or maybe people start to like come to us after the fact and be like, you know, I, I felt the same thing you did, but I was really scared to share it. And when I saw you share it, even though people thought I was dumb, I want you to know, I really, I think you're onto something. So we start to see these things. And then what starts to happen is the possibility that we saw in that breakthrough becomes the reality. And as that happens, we, the, the fear of the breakdown loses its power over us until eventually we arrive at a point where that breakdown no longer ever stops us. And from that point onwards, that commitment, that breakthrough, I'm committed to being visible regardless of my fear about what might happen, just becomes the way we live our life. That's how a breakthrough goes. So that in the future, we stop creating a life that's based around managing, not having that thing that we're scared of happen. That stops being what our life is about. Instead, our life becomes, how do I put myself out there? even though there might be some fear. And that's the way a breakthrough is created. Carol, I'm just, we're talking about, Darren asks about this thing in corporate America, Canada, which is like this context of, I want to be visible, but I'm supposed to not be. And what, what does it look like to create a breakthrough in that regard? How do we work with that? And what's actually going on? Um, Andrew, you're saying, thanks for making that connection to the need of the breakdown of the breakthrough. It's a great reminder that breakdowns happen on this journey and being aware of it. Yeah, they happen if we are willing to allow them. The, the, I think it's fascinating. One of the fascinating things is that the default human approach, the human nature is to resist and avoid the breakdown. And what we don't, we become more and more clever at figuring out ways to avoid a breakdown. How do I make sure that I don't feel like an imposter in front of people? I'll get better at reading. I'll learn how to be okay preparing for 20 hours before my presentation. I'll come up with really clever ways of not saying I don't know, or I'll become really comfortable saying I don't know, but in a way that allows me to retain the era, the era of like actually knowing or, you know, whatever. All of those are clever ways of resisting the breakdown of just coming to terms with what if I am an imposter and what is available if I stop letting that really stop me in my life. And so, so much of our work as humans becomes about avoiding and resisting a breakdown rather than about creating the breakthrough on the other side of it. Lydia, you're saying it feels like putting myself out there, even in voicing an opinion, even if voicing an opinion opens uh, opens me up, I think, to people responding with a reaction versus opening into communication about where I'm coming from. Yeah, yeah, it's allowing. If we want to, one of the funny things that people want is they want to be able to like express themselves. Off, they're like, I want the world, I want people to allow me to express myself fully and authentically. Great but are you willing to allow the world to then respond to you fully and authentically? And that's where, no, no, I'm not. I want you to hear what I have to say and nod your head and receive it a certain way. And what that does is it creates abundance as a one-way thing, which isn't abundance. 
I get to say whatever I want. You have to receive it a certain way. That's not true abundance. I think I have a belief that that's where a lot of like, you know, if, if I put my heart over on what I see a lot of like Republican discourse, American, at least Republican discourse looks about in the realm of like DEI and inclusion, like their sort of opposition to that. I, I think a lot of it is caught up in that sort of like it's hypocritical. You're telling me I have to listen to you, but then I can't share how I, you know, all of that sort of stuff. So we're not going to go deep into that. You know, that's a very high level thing. But but when we are creating the breakthrough, we're really allowing the abundance of the world's response to come back to us and not letting it stop us so that we can then gain access to a way of being no matter what our circumstances that previously was not available to us. Ruth shares, in a team development training at work, we did a trust quotient test. Ooh, a TQT? A trust quotient test? Mine came up that I can improve intimacy and in sharing myself with people. When I don't, the impact is that people may not trust me. I can see that more, relation more intimate relationships are not available for me. Yeah. One of the, the tenets, tenets of um, trust that I was given, like a practice, was practice giving trust as a gift. It's, it's a cliche for us to say trust has to be earned. That's the way we kind of create it. Trust has to be earned. You got to earn my trust. That's not really trust. That's a transaction. It's a series of things you have to do. And then what I bestow upon you is trust. Real trust comes from giving it like a gift off, just giving it to people. It doesn't mean you throw your car keys to a, a stranger and say, I trust you. Don't steal my car. That's that's dumb. That's stupidity. What it means is that we off, we give people to trust. We give people trust and we show up in accordance with that trust in such a way that allows it to be given as a gift. And then we in doing so, we're actually opening ourselves up to to being betrayed. Trust can only really exist if you're open to the possibility of being betrayed. And I don't mean open to the possibility of being betrayed like an intellectual thing. I mean that you are actually open to the pot, like you are conducting yourself being in such a way that allows someone to take advantage of your trust. That's where real trust exists. Again, it doesn't mean you go and seek out untrustworthy people and give them your trust. That would be silly. But it does mean that if you're going to give trust, give it. If you are, if you are wanting to offer trust to people, sort of like Ruth's talking about, like, Okay, I'm going to take a swing here. I'm going to share something intimately with this person. They might tell me that I'm a loser for feeling that way. That is trust. I'm allowing, I'm trusting them with this sensitive part of myself. And it puts me at a degree of risk. Lydia, you say being a leader takes wearing a type of armor that your heart can shine through. That's a fascinating distinction. A type of armor that your heart can shine through. Hmm. I, I don't know if I would like... I mean, I can totally see, I, I, I think that's a neat way to put it. I don't know if that's how I would put it because I, I, my, my, my context, I should say, my context for leadership is that the more, um, the more work we do, the less we require armor anyhow. The more um, we can allow people and the world to impact and show up with us, without us needing to protect it. And we can kind of like, because of the depth of our work and the grounding in ourselves and the connection with our soul and our, and our self and our, and our trust in ourself, we don't really require armor. We can absorb, we can receive and allow whatever there is to come forward. Not having said, or having said that, I still think that's a neat idea, type of armor that your heart can shine through. And Cami, you're saying from my context, we were repeating our childhood stuff all over the world, such an invitation to expand. Yeah, isn't that the truth? Like. I mean that I couldn't say it more clearly. We're we're uh, we're just recreating our childhood wounding and trauma and all of that, and then we become more and more and more and more sophisticated in the way we do that. As it that's why it becomes harder to see because as children we're not particularly sophisticated, and if if you have a wound that your the response you create is you learn to like snap at people. As you become an adult, you discover, oh, my angry whip sort of response 
that loses me relationships and I want relationships. Not a lot of this is conscious, but what happens is those two things then become in conflict and you have to resolve them. So you find more sophisticated ways to allow your anger to snap at people without having quite the same consequence. And what ends up happening is we kind of like bury all that wounding under layers of sophistication such that we can no longer see the wounding and other, 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 <laughs> other people can't really see it. And it becomes very hard to distinguish all this stuff. And we're just where we end up is sort of like, I'm just the sort of people, I'm just the sort of person that gets tired of people after a while. So I need to like, what I find works for me in relationships is I, I be with someone for two weeks and then I go back home. You can do that. It's just a really sophisticated strategy you ultimately had to adopt to be with all of these layers of stuff piled up on top of the childhood stuff. So I'm with you, Cammy, 100%. Let's, um, we've got a little bit of time left. So Andrew, you said, I'd love to hear your experience of corporate coaching. I would love to share it. So let's talk about that. So there's a couple different experiences I have with corporate coaching. Often, um, the like almost like the holy grail for coaches is that they get brought in by a corporation to then do work with a team of people. Because then you do whatever you have to do to get there, but then you're given like a bunch of clients. Or another sort of holy grail, and I, I don't mean to disparage it by calling that, it's just sort of like something quite desired because of what it alleviates. So another holy grail is uh, becoming a part of a company that then provides coaching to corporations and corporate clients, and then you kind of just get paired up. So that's that's one way that you can kind of get involved in corporate coaching. And then the, the other way is where um, you meet someone who works in a corporation and basically they become a client of yours. So like I have a few clients that are VPs or C-suite executives in various corporations. And the way those relationships came to be, the way they we started working together is I met them in some context or another, and then I enrolled them as a client. So what I find happens down that holy grail path is that, um, well, first of all, it it's like easier easier. It, this doesn't have to be hard, but if you relate to creating clients as hard, then this, this path is easier. It's easier to get the client. It's almost like the client falls in your lap. I just pay my affiliate fee and then the, the company I'm a part of comes to me and is like, hey, would you like to work with this person? We think they're a good fit. Let's do an intro call. And then you do the intro call and you get the client. So it's easier in that sense. If, if you don't really relate, like my experience of enrolling clients is it's just kind of fun. I don't go out and make it stressful or put a lot of significance to it. I just get into conversations with people. I ask them what they want. We discover, we work, blah, blah, blah. And then if they inspire me and, I, and they're inspired by me, we talk about what it might look like to work together. So it doesn't have to be hard. But if you experience creating clients, if your current relationship to enrolling people in the possibility of their lives and of coaching is that it's hard, then that holy grail path is easier. And that's part of the reason it feels like a bit of a holy grail, especially for newer coaches and when people are looking for corporate work. The thing I find about that kind of work with those kind of clients is that we haven't had to do any work up front to get them to a yes. The company sort of identified them as a candidate for, for working with a coach. And, and then the company is like, you, we think Adam might be a good fit. Do you want to talk? We talk. And there's no, there's no stakes for this person to say yes. There's no risk. They, they, if they say yes, the worst thing that'll probably happen is they'll work with me or you and it's not that good. And then they will be like, yeah, it was, it was fine. And that, and then they won't, it'll end. That's the worst that'll happen. The company is going to sort of probably put it on my shoulders. The reason it didn't happen is because the coach wasn't very effective. That's fine. But like, even if that wasn't the case, let's assume the company wasn't going to do that. There's no risk at all to them saying yes. And that I don't think is a very good thing for breakthroughs 
And I don't think it's a very good thing for choosing into a coaching relationship because a coaching relationship, at least of the type we're all here talking about, is all about transformation. It's about breakthroughs. So the difference between that kind of corporate client and the kind where I meet them somewhere and we, uh, we build a relationship is with those people, I actually have to enroll them in the possibility of their lives and of coaching. Like when I meet those people, usually the way it goes is like, I'll meet them traveling at an event or we'll connect on LinkedIn. Rarely that's, I've got a client right now that that's how we connected. And, and they're like curious about what I do. And I'm like, why don't we hop on the phone? We can talk about that. And, and, and we'll start to talk about their lives and what they want and blah, blah, blah. And then if I don't support them to get really clear on what they want from their life, there's a lot of reasons why they won't be a yes. Most of those reasons are because the risk in them saying yes is they got to create the money. They're putting their own money on the line. And if they're not doing that, they have to go to the company and enroll the company in saying yes. So they have to go to the company and say, hey, I would like you to pay a portion of my coaching. That is a far greater risk than just having the company come to them and say, do you want to coach? The risk is, if nothing else, that the company might say, no, you can't have that. I've had someone reach out to me two times, once, and then like a year and a half later, they reached out a second time. And both times, the thing in the way was ultimately this. They, they had the funds, the company could afford it, but they were really, they just couldn't get over their fear about going to this company structure and saying, I want to do this. Where are you on it? They wouldn't even ask. They wouldn't even get that far. It was too much of a risk. It was too scary. And so... <clears throat> So when I'm working with those people, there's sort of like the eye of the needle, the gateway of fire, the hot coals they have to walk across to get themselves to a yes. Their commitment demands something of them other than just saying yes. That's how every breakthrough you're ever going to create in your life will look. Breakthroughs are not created without stakes. Because remember, every breakthrough is preceded by a breakdown. And the breakdown is scary. We don't want the breakdown. Our natural state towards a breakdown is resistance, one of resistance. I don't want to do this. This is not the right thing. And so, hey, Rachel. And so as we're, as we're walking towards that, if there's no cost, if there's no risk to just choosing into the work with the coach, it sets us up a little bit for failure because choosing into the coach was easy. And now I'm playing the game of my life and oh, crap. There's all this stuff that I'm resistant to and I don't want to face. And so I find what tends to happen is when, when I meet people that are interested in the possibility of coaching in their lives and work with them to support them to see that possibility, to see what would be possible in our work together, and to, with support, overcome their fears and obstacles to, to getting into that committed coaching relationship so that they can they can actually make it happen. When I work with those people, they show up like fire. They show up so much more committed because they've had to do something to get to this point of working together. And from there, they create results like you wouldn't believe. Whereas the people that just had sort of the opportunity to work with a coach handed to them tend to create much more often um, sort of more like remedial results. Breakthroughs become, they seem to be much more elusive. And it's not that it's impossible. It's not that I'm saying if coaching is handed to you, you won't show up. It's just like, um, it's just rare because there wasn't, we didn't get the opportunity to build that thing before you got into it. So that's really my experience with, um, with corporate work is that these days, you know, I'm, a, I'm an affiliate of Accomplishment Coaching and sometimes they, they do corporate work and, and look from their group of coaches and sometimes they reach out. But often these days, I find it's, it's much more work for less money. And it's not really about the money or anything, but like the work itself is not as fun. It's not as exciting. It's not as thrilling because the client is not as enrolled. The client is not as committed to something. And the thing is that in, in coaching and in transformational coaching and leadership, 
you're going to come up with breakdowns. And sometimes those breakdowns are going to be in the relationship. And when the client is really clear on that thing they want to create out there, working with the breakdown is it's it's like heavy work or it can be at least it, it's it's you know shit there's a breakdown right all of the emotions all of your emotions as a coach and a leader all of that stuff still gets brought up but when you're clear on the breakthrough the breakdown is less of an issue because there's something you're looking towards whereas when people get into coaching without stakes they're less likely to have created a real breakthrough they're really committed to because it's not a requirement to saying yes and as a result, when a breakdown does happen, all of the attention tends to get focused and stuck in the breakdown. And that's not so much fun because it's not really what the work's about. Work is about the breakthrough. So generally speaking, I like those clients that I create, that I enroll, that I work with to get them to the yes. And the beautiful thing is they show up into the coaching having already created a breakthrough. You know, like I have a, a client who he's an amazing human being. He's just he's such a delight. And when we first started working together, there was a bit of nervousness about like him going to talk to the the sort of board or whatever of his company to like get the money to, to do this work. And so we had conversations. We supported him with that about him getting clear what for do it, why step over this fear and then what do you need? in place to actually not let the fear stop you. And then he went and he did it. And he was like, it, it was amazing for him. He's like, holy shit, like for so long, I've just been annoyed at them for the decisions they made and gone along with it. And then operated with a bunch of fuck you resentment. And what I learned from this process is like, I can, I can affect the change I want to affect. Like I have power to make the change I affected. And his leadership transformed just in that moment because he started to discover the power of enrollment as opposed to the power of permission. The, I, I, it shouldn't even be called the power. The power of enrollment versus like the, uh, I don't know, the weakness, I guess, of permission. Andrew, you're saying, I really appreciate you sharing this. It feels good to know that the practice of enrollment I've taken on these last few years with individual clients seems to draw out the higher level of commitment. It will be an interesting exploration to make corporate a part of my coaching practice. When I when I used to train coaches in the structure of accomplishment coaching, one of the weekends was business based coaching. And one of the things that happened is people got to sit around and then ask all of the staff, I'll call them the leadership team. How do I do this? How do I do that? Like just questions about corporate coaching. And one of the most common questions was like, how, how do I get it? How do like, how do I get it? How do I create corporate clients? Cause these corporations seem like these closed structures and my own experience, which doesn't have to be anyone's other than my own experience, is that we we look at the corporation as like this thing we have to get. How do I get in there? Like, do I need to seek out the HR person? And I suppose that would be a perfectly acceptable way to do it. I, I imagine that's totally something someone could do. My experience that like what's worked for me is it, treating it no differently than any other kind of relationship and going to where people are connecting with them, building relationship, talking to them about coaching, inspiring them in the possibility of their lives or of their team and the possibility of coaching and supporting them to create that. And then from there, you start to create clients and with your clients, you can start to be in conversations like, look, do you want me to do some work with your team? You know, I often less so these days because I'm a bit busier, but like I just volunteer, you know, hey, do you want me to come in and do a half day with your team? We'll talk about leadership. We'll do some works helping them see like the deeper person that's there, that understanding, you know, each other on a level deeper than, you know, a Myers-Briggs test. Is that something of interest to you? I'm happy to do that. So I just offer that to my corporate clients. So all of those things, um, those are kind of my sense on uh, corporate coaching. Let's see what else you say. I'm curious about your experience in making those types of connections. I've talked about that, setting up pricing. I don't change my pricing for corporations, but that's usually because my prices are pretty high anyhow. So I, I don't worry, that's not really a factor. Um, I will say that I've had it go both ways. I've had people, like a friend of mine was doing, um, she was setting up a corporate, bringing coaching to a company that she was an HR director at. And uh, she wanted Bay and I to come and be a part of it. And we were like, okay, great. And we, we worked with them. We created a package 
and we charge like what to us was a strong rate. Uh, so I think it was something like at the time, maybe for a year, $20,000 or something like that. And, and sh they were blown away by that. They were just like that. I can't that, you know, look, we, we really like you and we really want to work and I want to bring you guys on board, but it's just, it's tough because you're three times the rate, the going rate of any other coach. And we also did work with an oil and gas company here in Canada. And so that's like a big company, right? And uh, at the time, I think my rates were, Bay and I's rates were like $40,000 or something for a year. And the person who was like a VP, so he had like a whole branch, he was just like, you know, I can't justify it. Your rates are like three times, four times, you know, what other people are offering. And that was a bit like if that was my, I was working through someone. So I was really working to give that person the reins. But like, if that was me, I would, I would have sort of had more conversations with them to like, Hey, I'm happy to support you. So you can get a sense of how I might be different. But ultimately at the end of the day, it's a choice. You have to feel like you're getting the value from working with me. And if you're not, that's okay. You know, if you feel you'll get the same thing from those people, you should go with them. I'm not interested in trying to convince you of something. I'm interested in providing you what I have to offer and you getting to make a choice from that place. So we've, we've had that end of pricing where people were blown out by our rates. And then I've also had um, conversations. I've done some work with like um, corporations where we've sat down, we've talked, I've told them my rates and the person didn't bat an eye. They're like, okay, great. So we'll set that up. You'll need to invoice. And I was like, mm, no conversation about that at all. So it totally varies. And just like, People, people always want to know like, well, what can the market charge? Because if I know what the market charges and I align my rates with that, I don't have to stand for what I'm charging myself. And so that's the same kind of idea with a corporate thing, right? Like, oh, sorry, there's one more part. And if I do that, then I don't have to get a no. And then I, so there's some scarcity in that, right? And that's the same thing that happens with corporate rates. People are like, what will corporations take as pricing rather than individuals? Because then you don't have to stand by your own rates. You'll just do what is normal and you don't have to be with the no. And I, I don't find that a very powerful place to stand because we're not actually standing in our sovereignty. We're standing in like what we think will be accepted or well, that's ultimately it what we think will be accepted either by the market as a whole and corporations as a whole, or by this particular corporation that I'm in uh, dealing with. And so I just, I think far more powerful to just get really clear, like, what do I stand on as my rate? What is the rate I charge? And then start charging that. And then you can raise your rate as you raise your rate. Okay. I think that's everything about, do you tend to set the structure with the corporate, the company and the coach, multiple people, or just focus on one person? I let that, I don't set that up. Like I typically find coaching works best one on one with people. But if a corporation was like, we want you to come and coach a team, then I would be absolutely a yes to that. And then that would be a, a dialogue as opposed to something I would be like, this is how it is. Um, hey, Rich, it's good to see you, man. How is your corporation corporate package structured? What do I offer time wise for 20K? So my rates for a corporation are 65K for a year of work and the default would be I, I work with a CEO, a VP, someone in their structure for three times a month. Uh, actually, it would be less now. It would be like twice a month. And then they would get to come to the group calls where all my clients are invited for 12 months worth of coaching. And of course, I take December and June off. So it's actually 14 months total. And and I just like this would be no different than an image individual. And I would say like, you know, I make myself available. I read everything they send me via email or text. I'm available for like moments of emergency, but I'm also checking in to see what's the breakthrough and how best do I need to stand and be with this person to source, to source that. So it might mean I don't respond to everything they send, but I do read everything they send. And, um, and then if they were like, as with everything, it's a, it's a conversation rather than a one and done rather than interact a transaction. So it's not like going to the store here in at least North America, where you're like, what does this can of soup cost? That's how much it costs. I either take it or I don't. It's this is what I typically do. And then I would talk to them. How does that sit? What do you want? And they might be like, well, we really want you to come in and do like some work with our people. And I, I might be like, okay, how much? Mm, two days. Okay, great. And I'd think about that and be like, you know, I'm just doing it in the moment. 
They're like, okay, you'd pay for my travel and my lodgings along with food I eat while I'm there. And I'll throw that in. I'll give you two days. So I might feel like I might feel like doing that, or I might come up with a day rate, which would probably be something. Oh, geez, a day rate I would probably come up with maybe off the top of my head in this moment, two to three thousand dollars. Um, I have no idea if that's reasonable or not. I would have to figure that out myself. And sometimes what can happen there is I would offer something like that. I would do it. And then I'd be like, that was way too much work for for what I provided or for what I was remunerated with. And then I'd, I'd learn from that. Right. So there's no there's no right way to it. And most of this stuff I've, I've picked up from learning on the fly. Uh, Andrew saying, thanks, Adam. Great insight into this with a whole lot of other areas to explore. Awesome. I'm glad it's helpful, Andrew. It's a great question, Rich. Thank you. And Cammie's saying, also, group coaching pricing can be a great place to empower enrollment, charging each person what you charge one-on-one -on -one, instead of reducing your rate as a way out of enrollment, which I don't always practice. Yeah, that's such a great... Cammie's bringing up something really... Um, if you guys don't follow Cammie already, you should. She's a fantastic, phenomenal coach. Was there when I was being trained. And uh, we've we've been friends for many, many years. So definitely follow her and her work. Um, and what Cammie's saying is like a great challenge for all of us, right? Often what happens is coaches, we get scared about standing for our rates and we don't believe that people will pay them. And so then we create this thing called group coaching where we lower our prices so that we can get more yeses. And so we look at what do I charge for one-on-one? -on -one? Okay, that's 20K. I'll do group coaching for four people at 5K. And that way I can... I can enroll people more easily. I don't have to, I don't have to challenge myself to create enough possibility that someone's a yes to twenty thousand dollars. And so, there's 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 no right way to do this, right? But there's an opportunity if you really want to become more and more masterful at enrollment. The way to do that is practice. And the way we practice is we create a stand for ourselves to practice with. I'm gonna I'm gonna create a group. And I'm gonna enroll people at this higher rate. I'm gonna charge them like Cami's offering as a practice, I'm going to charge them each 20K to be a part of this group. And I'm going to stand behind the value of the group being every bit as powerful, simply different, but every bit as powerful as one-on-one -on -one coaching. It would be a very powerful way for us to show up as opposed to, you know, letting ourselves off the hook. Here's some other ways that uh, coaches let themselves off the hook. Leaders do this too. It's just less often with money because their salaries um, pre-set up. So they might say something like, um, I'm charging a discount rate while I'm still training. Don't just don't do that. Just charge the rate you charge. So it doesn't mean you have to, you can charge a lower rate if you want, that's fine, but stop caveating it. Because what we're doing when we're caveating is rather than be a stand for that rate and for people to, to create enough possibility with people to say yes into that kind of investment in their life, we're instead we're we're not enrolling we're convincing them we're trying to use this sort of like limited time offer this is cheaper because as a way of convincing them to say yes and that lets us off the hook it lets us off the hook of being a stand for possibility and that's what our work is as coaches is when people sit down with us to help them see what would be possible in their life and help them see how coaching could actually support them in creating that possibility I better check my calendar. What do I have? I got a call in a half hour, so that means it's a good time to wind down. I David wanted me to talk about um, how do I see coaches can bring epistemology and ontology into conversations in and with politics? What would be challenging about that? What would shift on our planet if we were able to open up to these conversations? And what do politics look like? So I'll talk about that real, real quick because um, it's so timely. So first, my... My, uh, I guess it's my context for politics, like how I experience politics, my thought about them, what I notice is that um, politics feels like a world of compromising. Uh, well, the, the lifeblood of politics, mm, thank you, Cami. I love you too. The lifeblood of politics is election. It you cannot continue to be a politician if you don't work to get elected. 
And so what I notice and experience is that above all else, getting reelected or getting elected is the primary first and most important thing. Principle is second to the first thing, because if you don't get reelected or if you don't get elected, your principles are irrelevant. You're not going to be able to put them into practice. So that right there, in my estimation, is flawed. As soon as we put something above our principles, we're in trouble. And so I don't have a solution here. But this is what I see. This is a significant thing of what I see is broken about the political system is that ontological work, transformational leadership and coaching is about putting our expression, our int it's about commitment to integrity. It's about living our life from within outwards, getting clear, like what really matters to me and then so on and so forth. I want to be clear that I am not saying I think it's impossible for a politician to not live from like a place of integrity, but the whole system, like the floor is angled all against that. And it's very challenging. And so if we were like, how could we have the entire political system as it currently stands become something completely shifted and lived as a function of integrity and ontological rigor and love and people being real leaders, bringing the quality of being a leader and all that, I think it would require something much greater, which is like, it would require it to, to put it on the politicians kind of lets ourselves off the hook because part of the problem is that we as a voting group buy into this system that puts reelection first and foremost. We, we let ourselves be swayed by what the politician is saying. We let ourselves kind of just turn on a dime when Biden came in and did this thing. We, we are so short term in our willingness to give people runway and to sort of be with their foibles and their humanity as it shows up. And we're like off with their head, vote that person out, put someone new in, I, you know, all of that sort of stuff. And so I, th I think this is, yeah, public funding of politicians, boy, would that be, or of elections rather, would be a good idea. There's so many um, things that I think are woven into the political system that I find it really, I'm a stand for possibility always, but politics feel, feels very intractable in its current state. And trying to iterate on the system, you know, trying to like, how do we, tweak the knobs a little bit like how do we make poly how do we make the election system less prone to fraud it's not prone to fraud it's very very well put together but never mind that for now those sort of questions i think aren't going to get us there and i think the real thing that we're facing is like a system that has reached the boundaries of what it allows for and ultimately what's called for is a breakdown and a breakthrough on the other side, a complete paradigm shift. And I, I have honestly no idea how that looks. And I also think whatever that break, I, I think we're heading towards that breakdown. We're seeing breakdown all over the place. Um, you know, people aren't even trusting in a system that including the former president isn't even trusting in a system that is like actually pretty secure. So we're seeing all these breakdowns and I don't know what the breakdown looks like, but I do know that breakdowns are messy. And when we're talking about a breakdown of like this scale, the messiness is of that scale too. So what I think we can do, what I think I can do, and perhaps by extension, what I think is available for all of us to do, but I have to keep my attention on myself, is I can do my own work. I can commit myself to like, noticing when I am pointing the finger at a politician or at a political system and putting blame there rather than going inwards to see like, well, where might I be perpetrating that same thing? Because here is where I can alleviate that. So if I'm frustrated by the Supreme Court's decision and their rigidity, well, where, where in my life am I ignoring things like that? Where am I becoming rigid? Where am I becoming righteous? Where am I out of step with public? You know, all of these sort of questions bring me back to the work that I can do, which is right here. And so that that's the best I've come up with. 
I haven't come up with too much. And it's why you don't hear me talk a lot about politics because I don't know that, I don't think that's really where, um, that's not where my best solutions are. And I don't know that that's where the best solutions happen to be. Uh, Cami writes, there is a great awareness happening in the world that is being stewarded by a man named Robert Ohoto called the intuitive adult. He's pointing to how we are, and brackets politicians, our childhood wounds per perpetuating adults. It's a fantastic place to look. Yeah, that's cool. One of the things I worked with a, a shaman out here called Naite for a year. I took a course that she led. It was a very challenging course. And part that course followed the medicine wheel of indigenous thinking. There's many medicine wheels and the, this one, the path of the medicine wheel went from child at the south up to adolescent at the west, adult in the north, and then elder in the east. And what part of what her teaching was, was that we've become calcified at the level of adolescence. We are locked at the adolescence. And as a result, we can't move from adolescence through to adulthood. We collectively are stuck as a collective of adolescence. And so kind of to your point, um, Cami, and I suspect what Robert is speaking to is like, so much of what we see is really this, it's a youthful kind of reactivity. It's a youthful capacity to be with stuff for only a short period of time before we have to make a decision to resolve dissonance and all of that sort of stuff. And, um, and the sad thing is like, our technology perpetuates that, right? It perpetuates a very young level of ability to hold attention. It perpetuates a short term attention span. It perpetuates a resolution of our dissonance and our discomfort quickly. You shouldn't have to be with someone else's opinion, cancel them. You shouldn't have to be with people disagreeing with you, delete them from Facebook, you know, all of that sort of stuff. So these are, these are, <laughs> these are challenging big problems and it's easy to get disheartened. And what again, brings me back to like possibility, soul and spirit is coming back here and doing my own work. Cause that I can work on this guy. And when I do, I notice my life gets better. And I also notice I have more space for the people that previously I was condemning the politicians that I didn't agree with, the people I thought made wrong decisions. And I can start to hold them with more love, more graciousness and um, more kindness without sacrificing my rigor or my stand for something different than what they may be up to. And well, I believe that's how the world changes. Great conversation. Thanks for bringing that, David. Really, really appreciate you um, asking those questions and really appreciate everyone for, you know, your, all of you partaking at, in this conversation at like a high level, because these are not easy conversations. And when you look into the world, what I see, when I look into the world, what I see a lot of youth, a lot of young energy and a lot of like fearful energy. Uh, uh, Stephen, what's his last name? Stephen Pressfield, who wrote The War of Art and The Legend of Bagger Vance, but I think The War of Art's his best book. He wrote about how when we are more fearful, there is a pull towards fundamentalism. As we get more fearful, we turn to fundamentalism. And the reason is that fundamentalism as a way of thought and a way of rules and stuff like that, fundamentalism, it's, it's a very sort of, um, it, it's like a clean response to fear. It's like, don't be afraid, here's the answer, right? Fundamentalism is a very like, boom, that's the answer. Abortion is wrong across the board. You don't have to be afraid of anything. Boom, you know, you're you're struggling to be with like your own sexual desire and at the same time your partnership that's been together for 20 years. Don't be afraid. All adultery and any kind of lust is immoral. It's wrong, right? Like fundamentalism is sort of like this guillotine that just chop. You don't have to think about it. Shut your brain off. And so he talks about how as as we as a species, as a collective, as an individual become more fearful, there's a natural pull towards more fundamentalist thinking, beliefs, and structures. And we're really seeing a lot of that, you know, like that Supreme Court decision, the like, so much, all of this, I really see that, that push towards fundamentalism. And it makes sense because we're scared. There's a lot of fear in the world. Okay, well, that's an uplifting note to end on. This book, this is the last plug right here. This gorgeous hardcover book. Look at that. 
Look, even oh, look, even on the cover, it's got it's got the artwork on the inside. Fuck yeah, what amazing book! Oh, look at this handsome guy on the back cover, smiling at you. <laughs> Total win. This book is proofed. It's ready to go. I need a hundred people who are willing to buy a Kindle copy of this book on the launch date for ninety nine cents. In appreciation for you supporting me that way, I will send you a free copy of the paperback. If you want the hardcover, you got to buy that separately. So what I need is people that are willing to commit to that launch date a day after a day before that won't help. It has to be that launch date because that ensures that um, we game the Amazon system and, and I'm recognized as a best selling offer and I'll buy shoulder or uh, elbow patches and a pipe and, and it will make it very nice. So if you're willing to be one of those people, please let me know. You can comment here. You can send me a message. You can email me. Um, but I'm collecting a group of people that are willing to help me that way. Uh, the book's amazing. You're amazing. I love you. I hope you have an incredible blah, blah, blah. That was meant to be amazing and incredible. Doing that a lot this, this live. An incredible weekend. See you later. Love you guys. Bye-bye.